<clears throat> so, firstly, um, förlåt, min svenska är inte bra. So thank you for uh, your patience with my English today. Uh, and, and thank you to Telenor Connection for giving me the opportunity to speak. Um, Telenor Connection is uh, an amazing AWS customer, uh, as are some other folks in the room. Husqvarna, Scania, you guys have done some really amazing, impressive work with their technology. So thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, I'm Eric Morales. Uh, I lead our video game business for AWS and EMEA. Uh, and, but I'm not going to talk at all about video games. <laughs> I'm going to talk a little bit more about the really fun stuff, organizational design, organizational culture, innovation culture, uh, and how to avoid the trappings of uh, getting stuck and being a big company, right? So uh, without further ado, let's jump right in. <clears throat> There we go. Yeah, so uh, this is our 1997 letter to shareholders, as it says right up top. This was a letter uh, that went out when uh, Amazon.com, our parent company, first went public. Uh, and it's pretty prescient. I actually really recommend that if you haven't read it before, take a moment, uh, Google it. You can find this. It's really, really interesting, and it still holds up. Uh, so much so that we actually attach it to the investor letter for um, uh, every single year including this year. So this is sort of a, it, it's become scripture for us, right? I'm not gonna go into huge detail into what's in here, but I will say that this first sentence in the second paragraph is what we're gonna focus on today, right? Uh, it's day one for the internet. What does that actually mean, right? So day one at Amazon is pretty straightforward. We didn't set out to be a giant bookseller. Right? We started with books, and I think a lot of people assume that that was sort of the core of the company, but we started with books with the intention of truly becoming the everything store. Right? Uh, our, our, we started with books because they're approximately the same size, approximately the same weight. Uh, that makes storing them really easy. It makes shipping them much more efficient. And it means that we could reach economies of scale that as we entered other product categories over time, we could have competitive shipping rates and we could bring products closer to customers faster over time. After books, we went for CDs and DVDs, uh, which also had predictable sizes and predictable weights up until the point where we could realistically sell motorcycles online and groceries and web services, which is my business. So, you know, day one is really our attitude towards any opportunity. It's always day one. And when, when it's always day one, that means that every product category, every uh, potential market is a blue ocean, right? We aren't uh, encumbered by the expectations of a different industry. Our angle is, let's experiment, let's see if we can make this work and go for it. So, if we have a, a broad definition of what being a day one kind of company is, right, then what is a day two company? So a day two company is a company that is more obsessed with protecting a line of revenue than it is about solving a customer problem. A day two company is a company that's become so entrenched in its business model uh, that it looks to its own customers with hostility and fear. That happens to a lot of companies. It happens to a lot of well-intentioned companies. And our motto, right, is that it's always day one because we promise to never become that kind of company. So functionally, how have we been able to avoid this, right? There, um, within AWS, actually, let me take a step back. Within Amazon, uh, there wasn't really a sales culture Right? And when you think about it, it kind of makes sense. It's a, it's a big website, you log on, you type in a product that you want, and you have access to SKUs that you can then purchase and have delivered to you. So uh, ultimately, why do you need a sales force for that? Right? It's really about identifying and showcasing products and helping customers come to their own decision. Uh, and so when we launched AWS, Amazon Web Services, that did need a, uh, it needed frontline business development and sales and technical resources to help customers understand how to use this technology. Um, and there's a stereotype associated with technical salespeople. Anybody who's ever worked in an IT department or a procurement department uh, knows that very well, right? It's usually... Um, somebody with an expensive haircut, an expensive watch, who drives an expensive car, who takes your order, uh, and then packages and ships you something that was overpriced to begin with, right? Uh, and, um, and that relationship can feel pretty hostile. It can feel very, you know, um, coin-operated, right? A lot like these washing machines over here. <clears throat> that doesn't really work anymore. 
So we've been able to avoid this through kind of one fundamental tenet, and that's simply obsessing over your customers. It's one of the key things that we recommend to every company we do business with, and frankly, every company we compete with. Obsessing over your customers means uh, that you have the moral clarity to innovate on their behalf. Our CEO, uh, uh, Jeff Bezos, often says, put the customer first, invent on their behalf, and be patient. And that's extremely easy to say. It's actually extraordinarily difficult to do. And it takes a little bit of courage uh, to, to accomplish that, right? Uh, and that goes back to kind of our day one mentality. Uh, bolstering this a little bit, we also recommend that... Uh, companies all over the world need to be comfortable being misunderstood. And sometimes you need to be comfortable being misunderstood for a really long period of time. Let's take retail for one key example, right? Um, if you think about e-commerce or even physical retail, if I were to poll everybody in this room about what would you want from a better retail experience, I'm gonna hear, most likely, we want better prices, I want faster shipping, uh, I want better selection, uh, I want um, you know, more efficient ordering processes, maybe some discounts, I want some loyalty programs. If it's a physical location, then maybe you want some subject matter expertise, maybe you want uh, somebody that you can speak to about this, right? Pretty conventional stuff. And, uh, and that's all helpful, but at the end of the day, it's not particularly seismic. It's kind of predictable, right, when you think about it. And so this is a scenario where, in many cases, customers don't actually know what they want. They've been trained to operate in a single avenue. Uh, and so it's the responsibility of a day one company to innovate on the customer's behalf. And so when we thought about this, right, how could we fundamentally change and alter and improve the way that people purchase anything? Um, we thought a little bit about what innovations have happened in retail, right? And forget about e-commerce. That's not that interesting or complex. But it took us meaning human beings, a thousand years to get to the point where we trusted our customers enough to check themselves out of a store, right? That's happened in the last 10 years, when you think about it. So when we uh, were thinking about what else could we do here, we thought, well, what if we could be pretty audacious, right? If, if it took us this long to get to the point where we trusted our own customers to ring themselves up, why don't we just get rid of the cash register entirely? Why don't we just get rid of, rid of checkout? Wouldn't it be really interesting if you could just walk into a store, grab what you wanted, and walk out? It's the ultimate in customer trust. It's also a really intoxicating and really cool experience. Uh, and this experiment, which is powered entirely by our machine learning and artificial intelligence, and yes, IoT services from AWS, is a really cool, bizarre, science fiction experience. And it's, it's been really successful. We're now opening these stores, not just in our hometown of Seattle, we're expanding uh, into New York, into San Francisco, and yes, into Europe as well. <clears throat> so this is a, an area where being comfortable being misunderstood uh, really works to the benefit of surprising and delighting our customers. Finally, uh, you need to celebrate experimentation. And celebrating experimentation is also something that is really easy to say, very difficult to do, because it means celebrating failure and examining failure. I'll give you a specific example. A few years ago, Amazon released a smartphone in 2014. I would bet nobody in this room has one. Uh, this was not a particularly successful effort on our part. Uh, but, you know, look, we, we had a lot going for us, right? There's only a handful of companies that have the kind of scale to build a piece of hardware with a fairly robust uh, uh, App Store ecosystem. This was built on top of Android. We had a lot of brilliant engineers working on it. The hardware was identical to devices like the Nexus 5 and the, and the Galaxy S4 at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also had distribution partners like AT&T in the US, so we were following a very similar trajectory to larger companies like Apple and Google and others. So why didn't this work, right? Well, it, it didn't, <laughs> and we ended up taking nearly a quarter of a billion dollar write-off on this, right? Uh, and we had a couple of options. We could have uh, doubled down and injected another billion dollars into this and try and eke out another one or two percentage points of market share for the next five years, or we could have just said, you know what, let's, let's just shut up and listen to our customers for a little bit, right? So what about this didn't work? Well, our customers told us that I don't need another device in my pocket. I don't necessarily want to come up with a, and, and wrap my head around a brand new interface for using the same thing that makes phone calls and answers emails. Um, 
what I need is something that kind of blends seamlessly into my life uh, and that makes it easier to do the things that I actually care about. And so we got to thinking with that, we, we took that feedback in and got to thinking, what could we do to kind of flip this around? Uh, and the exact same team that built this phone, the exact same one, uh, uh, an organization called Lab 126, uh, went back and seven months later released this product, the Amazon Echo, with the Alexa ecosystem powering it. And this is now a multi-billion dollar business that has spawned incredible competitors across the world, huge ecosystems around artificial intelligence and machine learning, and it's spawned a lot of innovation around, excuse me, voice as the new interface to the internet. So this is what we mean by celebrating uh, experimentation and, and yeah, celebrating failure and having the courage to fail publicly and examine it, right? So we talked a lot about kind of big topics. Let's talk about mechanisms. How did we actually uh, spur this kind of innovation and development in the company? So um, firstly, uh, we instituted a concept a few years ago uh, where when we identified a customer challenge, we would actually uh, literally write a press release for that customer uh, about what success looked like. So we still do this, by the way, even within AWS, when we're working with a customer like a, a large enterprise or even a, a high-growth startup, right? We will actually write a press release on behalf of the customer uh, on, you know, what is an ideal state for, the, for this project to be successful and then work backwards from that, right? Over whatever the, the time period is, five, four, three, one year, right? It doesn't matter. And, uh, and to, to tackle that challenge, we instituted a concept called a two-pizza team, Right? And so a two-pizza team is, it, we're a big company, you've got hundreds of thousands of employees, it's, it, it sounds really easy to just throw human beings at a problem to try and solve something, but that doesn't scale effectively. What, what does scale is taking a targeted group of six to eight people, maximum 10, and aiming them at a customer problem based on a customer uh, press release and working backwards, right? And these teams can be cross-functional, they don't have to report into the same person, that doesn't matter. The connected tissue is, what is the customer problem we're actually trying to solve for. Uh, and this has been extraordinarily successful. This has reduced channel conflict inside of the company. This has helped to speed up development times. It's helped to speed up customer, um, uh, customer scenarios. Uh, and it's made it really, really, uh, a really elegant way of working with our customers regardless of where they are. And we sort of adopted this internally because we had to. Uh, there's a big misconception that Amazon uh, is this, you know, super, uh, started out as this super bleeding edge, um, you know, uh, a web scale company. We were founded in 1994, right? So when we got founded, the only way to do things like build a store of our scale was to have giant Oracle databases and to have giant SQL Server installations, right? That was all that was there. So we know exactly what it feels like to be caught between those two worlds of being a big girl, big boy company who also has to compete with much more agile organizations. So we started out as a monolithic company and a monolithic team with monolithic applications. And in 2000, over the course of about eight years, we shifted to a microservices-oriented architecture. What does that mean for the non-technical folks? It means that Jeff Bezos in 2002 literally said to everybody in the company, if you're building a cool technology, uh, you're not allowed to keep it to yourself anymore. Uh, you have to expose that service to everybody else in the company uh, via an API of some kind. And that, everybody hated that decision, by the way. That was really hard. <laughs> because what that meant was, if you wanted to build a quick storage service uh, to host, for example, thumbnail images, you now had to expose that to everybody in the company, which meant you had to build an API that worked. It meant you had to um, write documentation. It meant that you had to do the things that you have to do when you build a product. But once we did it, once we got past that grind, we realized, you know what, it's not that far away to suddenly expose that to customers and all of a sudden AWS is born, right? And we've also done this as part of our business as well. So we've brought uh, our microservices-oriented approach to uh, delivering business value to customers and our kind of two-pizza team model of having cross-functional teams focused on customer verticals or customer use cases, and we've brought that everywhere else in the world. So at AWS, the customer controls the product, right? We don't package anything up and deliver it to you. Our customers are in complete control of all times. So what does a salesperson do? Well, we help you solve problems. Otherwise, 
we don't achieve goals, right? Uh, in addition, we can uh, focus on expertise and aligning focus for our customers. Uh, and it allows us to double down on market intimacy. In the Nordics, and specifically Sweden, uh, that meant that in December of last year, we opened up our region, right? This is a little bit of propaganda, so please bear with me, folks. But um, we opened up a region, which is a collection of data centers in Sweden for the first time last year, which we're extremely excited about. Scania was an amazing launch partner for us, so thank you, as well as several people in this room as well. And then um, we have B2B-focused, B2C-focused, IoT-focused, games-focused, uh, business development, marketing, sales teams here locally to work with customers. We are able to do this because of the two pizza team concept. <clears throat> And then finally, last bit of propaganda, I promise. We have our Stockholm Summit next week, uh, which is a massive event at Stockholm's Messen. It's free. Uh, we would love to see you all. Uh, and that way you can meet some of our team, meet some of our partners, meet some of our customers, most importantly. A few folks in this room will be speaking there as well. Uh, and we'd love to see you there. But, you know, fundamentally, that level of focus and drive is, is an expression of the original point we were covering, right? That at the end of the day, Every day is day one for this company, and it should be for yours as well. So if I can leave you with one thing, and then I promise I'll shut up. Oh, I think my last, uh, my last slide was cut off, but kind of the three key things to focus in on are obsess over your customers, um, embrace experimentation, and be okay being misunderstood. Uh, it's worked out for us so far. So thank you so much.